Dempsey and Michael Short will teach you about firearms, self-defense, and the laws that affect your rights to keep and bear arms. Visit GunOwnersRadio.com with questions to learn how to become a sponsor of Gun Owners Radio and get involved. Together, we will win. Now here's your hosts, Dave Stahl, Joe Dramisi, and Michael Schwartz on The Answer San Diego. All right, folks, welcome to Gun Owners Radio. Are you ready for this? Episode 258. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Michael. Hey, we are so proud to have John Dillon and the Dillon Law. Oh, I forgot. FM 96.1 AM 1170. The answer. Hey, we are so proud to have John Dillon on the, and the Dillon Law Group on our show. Sponsors. And did you know Dillon Law is one of the attorneys of the Miller versus Boni- Bonta? I messed that one up again. Bonta. 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 You were close. <laughs> and if you have legal matters that involve firearms, then you need to call attorney John Dillon. Especially if you have questions on red flag laws, gun registration, gun transportation, or maybe you need to know that your guns are California compliant. You can call our trusted firearms attorney, John Dillon. John Dillon specializes in California gun laws. 760-642-7150. Or you can visit his website at dillonlawgp.com. Oh, and if you're tuning in to YouTube live stream at youtube.com slash gunownersradio, like us and share it. So we got an exciting show planned today. We do have a cool show. We have Emily Chen coming up. She's a an instructor, a CCW instructor. You may know her on uh, if you're a big uh, Instagram fan. She's got a big Instagram following under the the name Aims to Misbehave. <laughs> That's um, perfect. Yeah. So we're gonna talk to her. She's has a real real interesting lady and. Uh, uh, a lot of professional experience with uh, guns and CCW and instructoring and instructoring instructoring that's and uh, competitive shooting. So uh, we're gonna chat with her and then uh, Joe's got a really cool article. What's your what's your article? Yeah, we're gonna talk about training and concealed carry this week because now I I have a a newer perspective here being an instructor. Yeah. So I get to see this uh, every week or two now. So um, thought and since it's concealed carry month. That's right. On the show. Oh, I was going to say. Good subject to uh, talk about. We have a concealed carry day <laughs> brought to you by our government. Yeah, of course we do. How sweet. So it'll be cool. It's, we got we have a bunch to talk about. We had a bunch going on this weekend. Uh, yesterday, we all went out to Lemon Grove Rod and Gun, uh, all the ambassadors for the Not Me, the women's program, mm. hashtag Not Me SD. Um, the ambassadors went, and uh, we had some 12-gauge donated to the program. So we took the ambassadors out, uh, and as a big thank you for putting in so much time and effort and helping so many ladies, uh, we taught them how to shoot trap. Who did the best? Oh, that's a good question. Who did do the best? You have to think about it. Wendy did really well. And they they were trading shotguns. There were four or five different shotguns. Uh, My goose gun, I have a big old 30-inch barrel with a full (laughs) choke, which is not great for trap. It's okay. It's not bad for trap, but... Um, and then they had a, a couple of over unders, and they actually had a couple of defensive shotguns, uh, just to, just to kind of let them. But a lot of fun. Them. It was a lot of fun, except there was a rattlesnake. Rattlesnake tried to ruin the day. Did you get him? They got him. They put him in a little bucket. He's a little guy. He's probably about. Oh a, yeah. He's so a they guy, saved him. They didn't. No, no. I'm up to four flies now. Oh well, really? With your assault? My jeez, that thing is so. I, Michelle says, "Honey, there's a fly in the laundry room." So you're up to four. How many have you missed? None. So you're 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 I'm, I'm just got it that in a thousand. Now she lost the one last night. She had it in the laundry room, and I hear poof, and, and then she doesn't know where it went. So, she <laughs> so thinks, you couldn't you couldn't hang that head on your. I am. She tried to hit it while it was flying. I said you can't hit it while it's flying. <laughs> I mean, let's you lead it. <laughs> sure, well, you can. That's just that's just more of a challenge. I that, can't. Or I haven't tried. That, I mean, that's what trap and sporting clothes. I know. Is. Yeah. That was why I brought it up. So we went we went down into the pit. They shot pistols. Everybody got to shoot all kinds of different pistols. It was distinctly different. So I was just a helper monkey. I was I was just, you know, here, let me get you some ammo. Here's, oh, gotcha. you know, let me carry this, you know, cooler or whatever. Um, but it was interesting watching, listening to women talk about guns and CCWs and holsters and how to do this and how to do that. Very different from listening to guys. <laughs> They're all very supportive. 
oh, you know, I just don't know about this holster. It just doesn't quite bit or fit my my body type. You know, oh, you know, girl, let me show you this. And you got to do this. You taped it. I'm assuming been perfect. guys are just like, man up. You know, what the hell kind of, you know, yeah. use that. You know, you, Come you, on, you know, or, yeah. you big sissy. Or bend or, it. Okay. Yeah. You got to bend this or, or shave that off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whip out the knife. Yeah. Yeah. We can fix that. That is so funny. Get a hammer. Um, but it was fun, and then we had our Guns and Moses uh, uh, shoot this morning. We had a ton of uh, mentors, which is very, very cool. Uh, thank you all, if you, mentors. If you guys are listening, thank you. We actually, a few. Uh, we had way more mentors than students, uh, so we always try to balance that. But I try. I got to tell you, it's it's kind of it's. I feel bad because we always overdo it. We want to make sure we have more than enough. Yeah, but I think the students. mentors understand that. I hope so. I hope I'm not making a bigger deal out of it than you it is. You probably are. Yeah, I just feel bad. They, because, they w- you know, I mean, a mentor is a mentor is a mentor. Yeah. And they, I mean, they, well, they you, wake- can find, you can find an unhappy mentor if you want. I mean, when I do that stuff, I, I do so much of it that I don't care. I, I'll, are you I'll an just, unhappy mentor? Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. I'll, I'll be a mentor if there's somebody for me. If there isn't, that's fine. I'll walk around in the back. I mean, I don't, I don't really care. But yeah. some people get upset with that. I, I've, you know, we've been doing this, what, five years? We've been around for six years. We've been doing this for five years. We've had thousands yeah. of people go through probably at least hundreds of mentors. I don't know if we've had thousands of mentors. Has their group gotten any bigger? Which group? Guns and Moses. So ever since uh, basically the beginning of COVID, mm-hmm. um, they've had dozens of people. I don't know about hundreds, but at least dozens of people, probably hundreds at the, by this point, of new people reach out, you know, contact them and say, hey, we want to learn how to use a firearm. Wow. And that's that's why we've had so many guns. We've had a monthly Guns and Moses really? uh, shooting social for over a year now. Mm. And he's got a, he's basically got a waiting list. So that's, it's a lot of interest. Yeah, that's really that's it. And they're super serious. They're not just having a good time. I mean, they are having a good time, but they're dead serious. Yeah, they're purpose driven. So their conversation's a little different than the girls. <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was telling them. You know, it, it, from what I've seen, the conversation at a shooting social for Guns and Moses is is different from a shooting social for anybody else, like a general shooting social. In that they're really more interested in the mechanics, like, okay, well, how do I load the magazine? How do I clear malfunction? Stuff like that. Because uh, they need to know. They want This isn't yeah, just they're a, not playing around. They're not playing around. This yeah. is something they, they feel, hey, self-defense this, this is going to save my life one day. So they're very serious about wow, it. Wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. So the uh, plot against the president, remember that uh, the, the uh, movie that we did? Oh, yeah. And, and you and I did a fantastic job uh, leading the crowd. That was I, I really enjoyed. I enjoyed both sessions. The one up in Orange, or ah, yep, Orange County, and then the other one in uh, right there in Mission Valley. Mission Valley, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, they were somehow the d- d- same movie, same people, but totally different. Totally respect. different, right? Night and day, and it wasn't good or bad. No, 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 no. Just totally different. What I was, mean, the what one was a difference. Well, the Orange County group was a little bit more subdued. That you could tell nobody fell asleep. Everybody watched it A to Z. I think we got a couple of hand claps. But dot in San Diego, man, <laughs> that place, these guys and girls were enthusiastic about this movie. Yeah, they came rushing in, and oh. they were cheering. And uh, Yeah, seriously. I mean, seriously. In the the most powerful. Clapping and hoorah. And, yeah, you almost had to watch the movie twice because they were hooting and hollering so much you could have missed some of it. Orange County was just a little more intimate. It, it felt like you were in somebody's yeah. living room. Yeah, you know, it, not not because of the size, but it just no, felt no, like no. it was it a little bit more intimate, a little bit more subdued. It, yeah. uh, both two beautiful locations. I mean, you couldn't have picked two better theaters yeah. to shoot the movie from. But M- Mission uh, Valley felt like a rally. <laughs> yeah, well, I was gonna say, yeah, no, it was, and the and the and and to be able to pull in. You know, the producer and, and yeah. the director. I mean, it was just, yeah, it was. So the reason I bring it up is the Q&A from uh, Plot Against the President with, with the director and, and a couple people involved, uh, Mike Cernovich and uh, Amanda, the, yeah, Amanda, the director, and I forget the, I forget the producer's name. He's a really, really dark good dude. Guy. Yeah, dark hair guy out of Texas. Really good guy. Really smart guy. That's up on YouTube. So oh, go to Gun it? Owners Radio's YouTube channel and check out the Q&A for the Plot Against the President. And that emergencies can happen to anyone. And there's no guarantee that the justice system will be on your side. Gun owners should have coverage for the legal battle after your self-defense battle. And while you protect your family and property, U.S. Law Shield is here to defend you 24-7, 365 days a year with a comprehensive self-defense coverage at an affordable price. 
Bad guys don't take days off, and neither does our coverage. Guess what? Gun Owner Radio listeners get a free T-shirt when you join. Just use promo code GUNOWNERSRADIO at uslawshield.com. So, I heard there was another big Second Amendment decision by the courts. What was that? There was. Back in the the Fourth uh, Circuit, which, of course, we're in the Ninth. um, We never hear about the Fourth. Not not as much, um, but it, it's you know pretty pretty important states there, Virginia and North Carolina and a couple other states. Virginia, of course, is a very important state mm-hmm. when it comes to uh, you know federal courts. It's just outside of Washington D.C. Um, a lot of people, of course, but uh, they just decided to um, in a in an appellate court court case uh, to strike down the ban against adults uh, under twenty one. From, from buying a gun. So back in the 60s, when they passed, I think it was part of the, uh, the 1968 Gun Act, mm. um, they said, okay, you have to be, uh, for a dealer to sell a gun to somebody, they have to be 21. They have to be 21 years old to, to buy a handgun. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't really know why. You know, and, and it's a really good example of, of when you know, a law passes and everyone just kind of accepts it. But now they struck it down. So yeah, but there's no. What's the reason? Why can't an 18, 19, or twenty year old get a get a handgun? Yeah, like what you, was happening in the sixties that you know they decided to limit they that were right to people to Vietnam? Well, it's the same reasoning. They <laughs> yeah. use, it's the same reasoning they use today. They they said, well, there was a spike in crime of young people. Okay, so yeah, young gang members. So what? So now, you know, again, you take one tiny little fraction of one percent of an age group that's causing a problem and you just punish everybody that way. And, and people got so used to it. You know, I don't yeah. think there was this huge, big, you know, rash of, I don't think every 20 year old in the country was going out and buying a handgun. And, no. you know, so people no. got so used to it. I would bet if you go to a mall or, or, you know, somewhere in the public and you ask people about, about it, it would probably be a very popular lot. I would guess that I'll, I would guess that most people would say, oh, yeah, of course, 18, 19, and 20-year-olds can't get a handgun. Yeah, until you point out to them that, well, that's exactly the age that we bring them into the military and give them real guns and send Biggins. them out to defend our rights to do everything else. Right, but, but, I, and I, but I think it's popular because you, know, you pass a law and people just get used to it immediately. Well, and the other thing, too, is uh, something else that 18, 19, and 20-year-olds are not is politically active. Yeah. So when that stuff happens to them, it's like, you know, there's there's not much of a reaction. Right. And again, that, that's a problem that all of us, I think, as conservatives and gun owners have, just so, not being active Not enough. being active enough. So the three judges, uh, just two out of three of them decided, uh, no, uh, you, can't, you can't limit someone's rights. If, if they're an adult, if they're an American and an adult, then the Constitution applies wow. to them. So if you're 18, 19, or 20, you're an adult. And uh, we, you know, you, we can't limit your right to keep and bear arms. We can't infringe on your right to keep and bear arms. Is there any chance? Because I don't know. Are any of these judges were they appointed by the Trump administration? The, uh, one of them was appointed by Trump. One of them was appointed by Bush, and the dissent uh, was appointed by Obama. Yeah, and the dissenting judge was interesting too, because that's what we were talking about a little bit earlier before the show. And it's like the dissenting judge wrote the dissenting uh, opinion on that. And, um, again, that's it, it's, it's what I call a corrupt judge, I guess. Uh, others might call them an activist judge. But, I mean, when he used terms like the gun lobby, this is another victory for the gun lobby. You want me to read the quote real quick? Yeah, go ahead. So his, his quote was, The majority's decision to grant the gun lobby a victory in a fight it lost on Capitol Hill more than 50 years ago is not compelled by law. Whoa. Yeah, the other thing he mentioned, too, I don't know if you have it in that quote, is he'd mentioned gun violence, which, again, is another political-type term. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the gun lobby thing I thought was interesting because I'd um, done research on this before when I was writing some article. But um, looking at the Just Facts site, if you think about the gun lobby, this is what they, they always talk about, the gun lobby this and the gun lobby that. Well, if you look at political contributions, there's a, a nice graph here, or a nice graphic from the uh, Just Facts people. And they look at uh, federal political contributions of interest group groups from 1990 through uh, 2020. Mm-hmm. And the biggest one, the leading one, is the health industry at about, uh, what, $2.3 billion that they've contributed. Number two on the list is lawyers at $2.1 billion. And uh, then it goes down. Number three is labor unions at $1.5 billion. Then you drop down the hedge funds at mm-hmm. uh, $676 million. 
And then you finally get down to books, magazines, newspapers at, what, $329 million. Um, defense industry, which you would think would be a lot bigger, is about $325 million. But you finally get to the gun rights. After all those other ones, gun rights over a 30-year period, $53 million. That's it. So that's the gun lobby. <laughs> we got to bump those numbers up. Those are rookie numbers. <laughs> yeah, those are serious. We got to 10 times those. Well, okay, so this judge, Judge James Wynn Jr., a, pre- a President Barack Obama appointee, he's the one that said the majority's decision to grant the gun lobby uh, a victory in the fight uh, it lost on Capitol Hill more than 50 years ago. In a fight it lost on Capitol Hill more than 50 years ago. Uh, this guy doesn't understand his role and where I was going when I was saying, hey, you know, uh, I, I think it's probably a popular law. I think it's that the majority of Americans would probably say, yeah, let's make it illegal for people under 21, adults under 21 to purchase a handgun. But that's the point of the court is they're not judging how popular something is. Right. It's not a contest to see, well, gee, if most Americans want this, therefore I'm going to support it as a judge. No. Slavery was really popular. <laughs> you know? Uh, they, a lot of people really liked that law. Oh, yeah. You know? And uh, that doesn't matter. What matters is it's unconstitutional. For So he's completely and totally missing the point. A fight it lost on Capitol Hill more than 50 years ago doesn't matter. That's not he's not here to judge whether or not, you know, the legislation is unpopular or how long it's been around or whatever, who won or lost a fight. It doesn't matter. What matters is is it constitutional? Yeah. And this guy completely dropped the ball. Wow. I wonder if he realizes it. Yeah, of course yeah, he realizes. Yeah, they know that. Again, that's that's part of being an activist judge and yeah. that's, you know, one side tends to do that a lot more than the other side. Yeah. And it's just it's unfortunate. Yeah, he said, uh, epi- epidemic of gun violence. So meanwhile, Congress stands at a partisan deadlock over numerous gun control proposals backed mostly by Democrats as President Joe Biden has issued executive orders and taken other actions to combat what, oh, what he calls epidemic of gun violence. I thought that was the uh, the judge again. But, uh, it, it, you know, and th- th- here's why this is important. Let's say you're, you're a, a staunch Second Amendment supporter. Let's say you're a gun owner. Let's say you're a member of San Diego County Gun Owners and you're you're in the fight right there, but maybe maybe you do kind of think, well, I don't know, maybe someone who's 19, 20 years old, maybe they shouldn't own a handgun. Maybe that is an okay law. Why are we so excited about this decision? Why are we so um, uh, uh, why is it so important to to your rights? It, say you're not 21, you know, or, or I'm sorry, you're not under 21. Mm-hmm. Why is this so important? Well, it's basically saying, hey, look, this it, this isn't a you know a second class right. You know, this is a right just like any other right. So just because it has to do with guns and some people decide that, hey, guns are not my thing, that doesn't mean you get to restrict it. Yeah. You're still, it's, it's, a, it's an affirmation that, hey, this, this is a civil right. This is a human right. Right. I mean, if you don't like asparagus, it doesn't mean nobody can have asparagus. Yeah, exactly. Well, again, it's, a, it's an arbitrary group, too. You've picked 18, 19, and 20-year-olds. So is there anything to say that, okay, you know what? Once you hit 65, you really can't have a handgun anymore. You know, it's it's the same kind yeah, of thing. The same thing. If once you if you commit down that path, I mean, there's no there's all sorts of other things you could do because you have precedent now. Well, and you don't have anybody beating the gun store's door down from the age of eighteen to twenty one wanting to buy a gun. I don't think you have. So I mean, it's it's more of just honoring the the, the law. Well, well, I'll tell you. So this case was. Um, uh, boy, her, her name just fell out of my head, and I'm I'm really I feel really bad about that. But this case, the main plaintiff in the case, uh, was a 19-year-old woman who was being uh, uh, hurt and attacked oh. by a by her spouse. This was a domestic violence. So case. she wanted a gun. She, so she wanted a gun to protect herself, specifically from a from a an, an, an I'm sorry, an abusive ex-boyfriend. So it wasn't a husband; it was an ex-boyfriend. Yeah. 19-year-old woman who had a protective order against an abusive <laughs> ex-boyfriend. Not worth the paper. Had a piece of paper. And I, I wish I could remember her name. I'm so sorry. I can't remember your name. I, I said it. I, I was sure to talk about it at the KUSI interview that we did on Friday about this. Um, but she, she, I'm sure she's a, a lovely woman, and she, I'm so proud that she she's stood up. She got tired up. of getting beat up. She got tired of getting beat up, decided, hey, I'm going to defend myself, protect myself. But then when she found that her rights were being trampled, she didn't stop there. She said, you know what? Wow. This isn't right. I'm going to file a lawsuit. And it went, you know, it's all the way into the, you know, the appellate court. Of course, it's going to go, uh, it's probably going to have to go further. Probably going to rehear it in front of more judges on the, on the, in the circuit there. Yeah, but she's um, a good spokesperson just for that law. I, you know, I just think it's great, but it's important. This isn't simply a, a victory for the gun lobby. You know, this guy voted, this judge voted that this 19-year-old 
you know, that it's morally superior that she gets beaten than it is for her to be able to defend herself. Yeah. Well, it's no different than people that are not vaccinated or killers. It's what, say, say again? heard that? Oh, yeah, that's true. The latest uh, Biden the, the proclamation. Latest Biden. Oh, oh, the people. Wow. If you're not vaccinated, you're a killer, and you're killing people. I mean, it's the same, it's the same mentality, it's really, when you come right down to it. Yeah. Of course, it puts us right in the group, the same group with Facebook, because they're killers. Too yeah, now, they're killers, too. Biden. <laughs> you didn't hear that, huh? No, I didn't hear that either. Oh, yeah, he did it very well. <laughs> I give him credit. And everybody, you can hear a gasp in the in the room, all his handlers. And all of his people in the back. What did he just oh, was it, this is another a, a Bidenism uh-huh. when he, he yeah. went off script? And, oh, yeah. I'll have to check that I out. I love it when he goes off script. I mean, I would almost send him a dollar every time he goes off script because it's crazy. Yeah, he didn't whisper this one. That would have been a nice touch if he'd have No, he didn't this. whisper this time. Just jumped right out there yeah. with it. He, yeah, he just jumped right out there with it. Well, it's and with someone we're going to talk about later in the show, there's a lot of pluses and a lot of minuses when it comes to your gun rights. This was definitely a, a pl- plus, plus yeah. even though we're under a uh, a siege. Well, under the worst, uh, you know, anti-gun president that we've ever, ever. had. So, yeah. so what happened on that? Just to follow up on that ruling. So, mm-hmm. so the court it was a three panel, yes, three panels of judges, yep. and they they ruled in favor of that. Yep. And where does it go now? So, so now it gets kicked back down to the lower court. But basically, what's what's mo- most like it's a couple of things that could happen, and we're familiar with this out in California. They could have an en banc, which means that they would it would rehear the case in front of all the judges. Oh yeah, see yeah. if you can get a bigger group of activist judges. To get yeah, it. but I think it's, it's like twenty. And I'm not really familiar with the Fourth Circuit. I don't know how they normally we'll are. To, we'll, be, we'll get in touch with Dylan and find out what that skinny is. But but yeah, so it's it's not done yet. And of course, there's a case out here, the Jones case. Same case, adults under the age of uh, 21 trying to buy a gun. So so same same she, process as we'd go through out here, just different yeah. numbers. But, but meanwhile, she still can't get a gun. Not, No, she cannot. And she's got this doorknob out there harassing her. That's my understanding. All right, folks. Hey, Blackhound Optics, accurate, affordable, guaranteed sporting optics that go the distance and backed by customer service that goes that extra mile. Great guys, great products, and a great company that is making optics affordable. On top of quality optics, they pay close attention to the customer's experience. And did you know their scopes come with mounts? So you don't have to worry about finding one that fits. We are so excited to have them as an official partner of the show. And for them, for ask for them at your local gun store or find them online at blackhoundoptics.com. All right, what are we going to talk about? This segment. Sorry. So we were just talking about a, a great court case that, you know, again, helps um, validate, or maybe it is the right word, uh, your Second Amendment rights. Mm-hmm. But basically say, hey, this is an important right, and it's uh, it's being far too infringed upon. There's, there's really a lot of good. There's a little bit of bad uh, going on when it comes to the Second Amendment right now. I, I think we're headed into a bit of a golden age when it comes to, to firearms that, that was kicked off really by Heller versus DC in 2008. The 2000s, from 2000 to, uh, uh, you know, for the next at least 10 years, it was, it was the attitude was, what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, there was so much bad happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that started even earlier. Maybe it started, maybe you can really kick that off federally with the assault weapons ban in uh, 94. But uh, when I got into it back in the again 2000s it was hey what's the plan and what are we doing here because Mm -hmm. every it seemed like every year things would get worse and Mm -hmm. worse and worse and i i know a lot of people it's easier to feel bad than it is to feel good you know feeling bad's easy Mm -hmm. um complaining is real easy you know just look around yeah but uh there's a lot of really good things going on people kind of get stuck in this mentality that oh geez you know everything's bad california's horrible gun laws oh my gosh oh my gosh we gotta leave we gotta leave we gotta leave. yeah but it really does feel like two steps forward one step back Mm -hmm. um where it used to just be about three steps back every year (laughs) there was no steps forward, no steps forward three steps back is how are you are you telling us that you get this eerie feeling that we're winning the war i i think we're making progress like in a way that i've never seen and and i think you think the other side thought we would give in or give up i don't know i'm not sure i think that they had such an easy time for so many years because we didn't say or do anything basically and then we realized wait a minute this is getting really close to taking my rights away yeah and you know it's like you push a a calm person into the corner 
and keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. Next thing you know, you get punched in the face. <laughs> right. I Figur- mean, really. Figuratively. Is that figuratively. personal experience there? Or? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, Mikey, you're the same way. You, how far you do you have to be pushed before you blow up? I, 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 I don't get mad. I get even. Yeah, and same with you, Joe. <laughs> Joe, how hard do you have to be pushed before you finally retaliate? Yeah, it takes a lot. Yeah, see, and that's the problem with conservatives, I truly believe. I've never seen an, an irritated, upset, angry conservative. Hmm. I mean, think of one. Think of one cons- one conservative that you know that's constantly you know, angry and, and always upset. I don't know of any myself. Hmm. I think it's well, a trait. The, the great insurgency on January 6th. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. Those too. two grandmothers look pretty fierce. That's the ones right. That they, We're uh, still not letting you out of jail. jail. You're going to be in there for a lot more. <laughs> well, if you know, if you're if you're listening and you in the first thing you thought when I said, "Hey, a lot of good things are happening and, and that we're winning in a way that I, I you know, and I've never seen before." Crazy. And if if you're if you're honestly, if you're out there listening and you and the first thing that came to your mind was something bad that happened, you know, like, "Well, gee, what about the roster?" Or, "Oh, yeah. gee, golly, what about this? What about that?" Um, you know, I, I think it's it's time that you become a glasses half full person because mm-hmm. you're definitely a glasses half empty guy. Well, right. you have to remember too out here in California, we have a really skewed view of what's going on, and and you have to keep in mind that you know there's really only what six or seven states that are pretty bad Second Amendment wise. Yeah, you know the other what forty three states are are pretty much okay right. gun wise. And, um, you know, the, the thing you got to think about is you only hear the bad stuff. Because if you think about it, you know, our, somewhere along the line, we lost our media and our free press. And we don't have that anymore. It's more like just a propaganda arm mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Which and, and that's not an overstatement. We went out to uh, breakfast this morning. We ate, uh, had breakfast at Janet's in Santee. Mm-hmm. And um, they had a TV monitor up there, a screen, and they had ABC News on some, some news show this morning. And, um, you know, I was kind of glancing up at it and it was, it was just propaganda. I mean, (laughs) I mean, it was just, it was the, uh, you know, attacks on the anti-vaccine people and attacks on this attacks on that. And that's all it was. And well, that's what people see now. So I think is. you get that skewed yeah. view of things. Well, and, and that's why I really want to point out, if you had said 10 years ago, let's say that there was going to be, uh, you know, 5,000 people in San Diego with a CCW and 25,000 people in Orange County with a CCW and thousands more in Riverside and L.A. is starting to issue CCWs. Had you said that to people, you know, most counties in California are issuing, regularly issuing CCWs, most counties. Mm -hmm. Um, Had you said that, to an activist, to a gun owner, ten years ago, they'd have laughed in your mm-hmm. face. Yeah, mm-hmm. and but it's happening, and we're well over what, and 20 it's not million, an accident. Um, nationwide, right. for Permit holders in what twenty-one states now, I think, mm. have constitutional carry. So that's another thing. Twenty-one states don't just have CCW; that's just shall issue. That used to be the gold standard. Oh, right. we want everybody to be shall issue. They're not just shall issue. Twenty-one states are constitutional carry. Have you said that to someone ten years ago? You know, someone in the gun. Uh, world you're crazy there's no way yeah there's no way that's going to happen and now we have 21 states including one of the biggest states in the union texas right that, that's an amazing story i've got friends in texas that listen to this show and and they'll every once in a while on the way home they'll call me up and they'll say really <laughs> he says you really have to do that you you know the gun roster really blew him away when yeah. i told him that you know if we want to put another gun on the roster we got to take what two off yeah, well, and you have to you have to have a technology that that doesn't exist. Exactly. And then you have to take two off. Right? And he says, "You're kidding me." I go, "No, no, 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 no." And you know the assault weapons decision that just happened. You know that he stayed his own decision. I get it. It had nothing's changed in your life yet, mm-hmm. but for the first time ever, a federal court said, "Yeah, these these assault weapon bans are yeah. unconstitutional." And That's everybody huge. else is going, "Yeah, okay, I get it." That's it, but it's huge. But California's up in arms and. You know, oh my goodness, what have you done? You can't do that. Well, it there's, is. there's court cases too addressing most of those bad things that you just mentioned that are working their ways through the courts now. So I mean that that's a definite positive thing to look at. Yeah, from from our own backyard, if you look at San Diego, there are more people in office fighting for Second Amendment rights. There are more people doing activism mm-hmm. in support of the Second Amendment. There are more gun owners. There are more people carrying a gun. There are more people with CCWs. I mean, we're headed in the right direction. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, that, for example, San Jose just had their that gun tax pass, you know? So that's a that's a step back, right? That's a step back, yeah. It's a step back, you know? Um, the, the assault weapons 
uh, decision was was stayed. You know, I get it. There are bad things happening, but the reality is we've proven without a sh- beyond a shadow of a doubt that activism, true activism, raising money, organizing people works. It works. It does. And it's, yeah. it's something you have to do for the rest of your life. It's not. There's no silver bullet. Yeah. And, and of course, it's not going to fix itself overnight. And it's not going to fix itself overnight. It's not going to. It's not going to happen automatically. Because if we let up, then it'll. The other side will come on even stronger. Yeah. You know, it's like anything. If you if you know what you're doing is the right thing to do, you you have to commit. Just like you did. I mean, you quit a perfectly good paying job and you dove into San Diego County gun hunters with both feet. And you have not looked back yet that I'm aware of. Well, and and good things are happening. Good things are happening. And I you agree. know the new boogeyman is you know ghost guns. That's the new oh, yeah, boogeyman. That's the new one. You that's know? the new one today. Yeah, and that's and they're they're we're going to actually talk a little bit more about it. But uh, but that's the uh, you know even if we are taking two steps forward and one step back, we're still moving forward. Right. You know. Yeah, they're not all back steps. But the but the I, de- I definitely say, Joe, do you agree? The ghost gun is the new. You know, the new boogeyman. Yeah, certainly here in San Diego, anyway. But again, you know, looking at that too, they're they're blaming a surge on crime, right, on, on ghost guns. So that's that's the San Diego City's uh, um, justification, I their guess, for their, for their new thing to attack. But realistically, you know, crime's been increasing in cities all around the country, and it's and it's due to unfortunately the bad Democrat policies that have been going on for the last couple of years and in a lot of cities for decades. Which they won't admit. And yeah, and they're seeing that all around the country. When you talk about defunding police, when you've got police agencies that for political reasons won't support their officers, then what happens is the officers don't do active policing anymore. They hold back. Hmm. And what you see, the result of that is you see increases in crime. And uh and that's what they're seeing now. And like Michael pointed out, it has nothing to do with ghost guns, Mm-mm. you know. But I mean, that's the excuse that that is used now to crack down on these things. And well, and like you said, Dave, you just hit the nail on the head. It's just it's just a talking point. That's all it is. That's all it is. It's just a talking point. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of good things are happening, and I I, I for one, uh, you know, uh, have been extremely excited about it. Well, I as mean, close as you are to it, probably more so than the other the two of us. Because, I mean, you kind of eat, sleep, and drink it all day. I mean, and it would be easy to be disillusioned and depressed and down. What was your uh, what was your deal at KUSI? Oh, it was about the court case. So they interviewed. They wanted to hear about the Fourth Circuit oh, court God. case okay. for all adults right. under. And, and that's another thing. I, I mean, you know, five years ago, before San Diego County gun owners, I never, there, was no, there was no pro-gun story on, on the 6 o'clock news, KUSI or otherwise. And who, what other stations called you? Uh, on that one, not not no one, but KPBS a, a couple days earlier. Yeah, yeah, I was on talking to them. KPBS, KPBS folks. No kidding. KPBS. Now you know. So now you know you're turning on uh, the six o'clock news, or everybody in San Diego turns on the six o'clock news, and they're seeing something. We're not just preaching to the preached anymore. Right. You know, we're outside of the bubble. You're actually seeing a pro second. Man. I'm on. You stand, someone from San Diego County Gun Owners is on so often on on local news talking about usually Some, good news. Yeah, yeah. So often it's just not. It's not even special anymore. <laughs> you know, people kind of go, "All right, yeah, that's cool. There yeah. he is again." You know, which in a way is a little bit dis- disheartening because they should be listening. Because you know, they should be listening. But I don't know. I look at it as, "Hey, this is now part of the culture." Like San Diego culture. You know, a small part of the culture is that we have, okay. uh, you know, a pro Second Amendment voice You'll in the six o'clock news. You'll know when you've done good when you're on eight, ten, and thirty nine. Well, we've been on eight, ten, and thirty nine, so you? we're doing good. So yeah, we're doing good. Yeah, yeah. just normally, not last week. <laughs> normally, they wouldn't talk to you. Yeah, well, there was a time, right, that they wouldn't talk to you. It, you know, it, it, they, it didn't even occur to them. It didn't even occur to them. You know, they they to to report from that angle, and so we've well, we've done a lot of things to work with them. But ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, KPBS, yeah. KUSI. Well, you do but know if you them. go into the newsroom, they're all watching each other. Yeah, and I'm sure it's a fact. They all went, "Hey, you see, was on KUSI. <laughs> Man, we better get that guy." The the KPBS lady, she was like, uh, when we when we we did the interview, she goes, "Oh, I like your uh, your brick wall." She said, "I've seen I've seen you in other interviews. There's a brick wall behind me in my oh, in my yeah. Zoom. You know, so I've seen you in other interviews, and I was hoping you'd be in front of the brick wall." And I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. oh, that's the high point of this. Whole anyway, interview. so what I'm trying to say, folks, glass is half full. Keep the chin up. We are winning. Is it may not be as fast as we all want, but the fact is, we're moving forward.
So normally we have to wait until the end, but today we're putting Mike's mic drop right in the middle of the show. Stay tuned. Oh, I can't wait for that one. Hey, folks, are you tired of your money going to big tech companies with First Amendment issues like Amazon, Google, and Apple? Well, check out Free Speech Alternative, conservativeeconomy.com slash gun owner radio. You can shop electronics, home goods, office products, and something you won't find on Amazon, guns. And there's a lot more. When you shop at Conservative Economy, you also help Gun Owners Radio. Just go to conservative. Try one more time. I got it. Conservativeeconomy.com slash gun owners radio. That's conservativeeconomy.com slash gun owners radio. You had to let out the clutch there, Dave. It's Joe's fault. He made me do it. All right. So now, further ado... Yeah, so this uh, this subject was uh, rather sizable, so I decided, you know what, we're just gonna uh, we're gonna turn it into a, an earlier segment, and uh, we have a couple of extra things for my nephew. We're gonna try to stump him on, so we decided to move this up and give it its own segment. So, without further ado, this week's mic drop. Mic drop. So last week, a bunch of news agencies reported that the city of San Diego and the San Diego Police Department is going to go after ghost guns. They had a press conference, and the police chief made a statement. The city council members involved were Todd Gloria, who, of course, is the mayor of the formerly great city of San Diego, city councilman Raul Campillo, and city councilwoman Marnie Von Wolpert, both newly elected. They made the San Diego police chief give a bunch of statistics about how crime is spiking the city of San Diego. Some of the examples are... Uh, There were seven gang-related homicides compared with four in 2020, three attempted homicide cases compared with one at this time last year, a total of 34 assaults with a deadly weapon compared with 19 in 2020, and nine drive-by shootings compared with two in 2020. Those are the statistics they gave to to, uh, to start bashing on ghost guns. But wasn't there a common denominator in that whole speech? They're, they're gangs, all they're, they're all gangs, gangs. exactly. Gangs, they're all professional gangs. criminals. Oh, and gangs. The police, the police chief. Who, by the way, the police chief does the bidding of the city council. Yeah, he's, he's not like the sheriff. The sheriff's elected; he gets to say what he wants. Police chief, he's got to tell. He's got to. He's got to comply yeah, with what his line. bosses tell him to to do and say. So the police chief was made to say, "Our quote: Our violence reduction plan and new ghost gun team will combine proactive policing." with special investigations to use knowledge and expertise to find those who are causing this violence and stop it before it happens. Mm -hmm. Every San Diegan deserves to feel safe, and we believe these efforts will help us in reaching that goal, end quote. That was their violence reduction plan. (laughs) What was the old plan? (laughs) Is arresting people and jailing them not designed to reduce violence? I'm under the impression that having consequences and enforcing them is attempting to reduce whatever activity you don't want. Well, anyway, so here's their idea for quote-unquote stopping violence, labeled as a ghost gun plan. They're assigning additional investigative personnel and specialized teams to violent and firearm-related crimes, gathering information and performing intelligence-led enforcement of suspected problem areas, sharing intelligence and maintaining contact with outside agencies, utilizing uh, added investigative techniques to monitor, locate, and arrest wanted suspects and those illegally possessing firearms. So this is all new stuff? Like like somebody they... had an epiphany that, oh, wait, this is what we should do, so they haven't been doing this. You know what now. this sounds like? It Law sounds like uh, police work. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like pretty basic police. sounds like the stuff I used to see in Dragnet. I was going to say it sounds like <laughs> bad boys to me. Yeah. So they went on to blame guns as if the gun made these career criminals, as you pointed out, Dave. They're just a bunch of career criminals, yeah. cause harm to people. Quote, I have personally seen the life-saving effects that common sense firearms safety measures can have as a former member of the city attorney's gun violence response unit, Campillo said. We urgently need to take action to protect our neighborhoods from untraceable ghost guns, which have sadly been used in numerous homicides in San Diego. Wait, what? So isn't all that stuff already illegal, and aren't there teams of cops already working on it? 
and they're being reactive, not proactive. Yeah, and, and it's got nothing to do with ghost guns, by no, the way. No, it has nothing to do with <laughs> I mean, what if the guy used a baseball bat? Okay, so that, that raises the question, why call a violence reduction plan an initiative to get rid of ghost guns? Well, don't be fooled by the headline or the platitudes by the San Diego County members, or San Diego council members, rather, Todd, Raul, and Marnie. Most of the headlines reporting on this story read something like this. San Diego police announced crackdown on violent crime ghost guns. This isn't about ghost guns. Like we talked about earlier, the ghost guns are just the latest boogeyman. This is those who want, are, who want to cause violence, and uh, we're trying to stop it before it happens. That's what law enforcement is designed to do. Every San Diegan deserves... Oops, 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 oops. Off script there. Joe. Dive radio. He's been to my school. <laughs> so this isn't a crime issue. Or, I'm sorry. You are a role model here. <laughs> Apparently. You do quite well. Basically, the, the gist of this thing is they've these politicians have sold their soul to the defund the police right. section of San Diego. Um, now, you know, not all Democrats are defund the, the police, but all defund the police folks are Democrats. Right. With with few exceptions. I mean, it really is a, a movement of, you know, a sub genre of Democrats. Well, wait a minute. I thought the president said that Republicans were defunding the police. Wasn't yeah. that the Republicans' <laughs> idea? Yeah, but we're talking about reality here. Yeah. And you did hear that the last, I don't know what city it was in, that they have decided when there's a 911 call and it's a robbery or violence, they're going to send us, they're sending us. Social worker. A social worker in some cases. Well, yeah, if it's not if it's not violent, they're going right. to send a social worker. Well. well, this is really all, it's a PR move is what this is. Yep. They're calling you, the gun owner, um, villains, uh, and they're basically, this is a plan, this is a, 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 a an idea mm -hmm. to cover their own failures. They've they've decided, hey, we're going to defund the police, or at least, at least we're going to cater to, you know, and uh, uh, speak the language of the defund the police crowd. So they can't put more resources towards police you know there's been this spike in violent crime you know and, and the cops are san diego pd are, are saying hey we need more resources as we just read every step they're taking is basic police work this isn't you know a new helicopter or something like that well, or some kind of technology so they have to figure out a way to fund the police and give them additional resources without upsetting the defund the police crowd how do you do that you call it a ghost gun issue which it has nothing to do with ghost guns. Well, they can, I mean, if they defunding the police is one thing, but all they really have to do is tell the police officer, do what your job is and enforce the laws on the books. Yes. You go out. And you, we'll support you if you yeah, do that. You well, so there, so that's you arrest criminals. You, you, you break up the gangs. It's not like they don't know where the, the gangs are because they have a gang division. So that is, in essence, what they're doing. But the police department's coming back and saying, "Hey, we need to. We don't have the. We don't have enough. We don't have the resources." So, in political speak, resources is money. Right. So they went back to the city council and they said, "Hey, we have this. You guys wanted us to stop doing this and stop doing that, and you're all wrapped up with you know appeasing people that were you know mm -hmm. saying, hey, we need to stop violence by uh, you know doing what the people who are violently rioting says to do, you know.' And now there's this huge spike in violent crime. We need more resources." AKA money. So the what what can't happen the city council can't say well we're going to give cops even more money cuz this yeah, short defunding you. Yeah, cuz this short experiment with defunding the police didn't work. So what what they can do is they can say well we're going to provide more resources to get these evil ghost guns off the street. Cuz that subset of democrats, the defund the police folks, you know, what do they have in common with with uh, with with the you know the rest of the Democrats is that they're they're in most cases anti gun. Right. So if you say, hey, this is a ghost gun problem, oh well, yeah, we need to get rid of ghost guns. But the reality is, if we flash forward two years, and we go back, and if if you can you know directly draw a line for all the people that are arrested and put in jail um, due to this new level of enforcement, which is basically an old level of enforcement, which with new resources, how many of them are going to be, you know, people of color, probably the vast majority of them. Cause as we've seen, these gun laws are disproportionately used against people of color. Mm -hmm. Now that may or may not matter to you. It may or may not matter to, you know, you, the listener, but it does matter to the defund the police people. 
And that's the entire point. Wherever you stand on defund the police, either you totally support it, you don't support it, you kind of support it. That's not what this is about. I'm not. I'm not saying it didn't. It didn't work. What I'm saying is the San Diego PD said it didn't work, and the city council is trying to get them more money, but they can't just come out and say, "Hey, we're going to give you more money" because oh, gotcha. they're going to flare up their base. Right. So what do they do? They fall back on this plan. They're, now it's a gun issue. Now it's a gun issue, and they're as anti-gun as the day is long. That's what's really happening. That is your extended mic drop. Mic drop. So that's just their way of painting the fence on both sides. Well, maybe you heard of Mike Lindell and My Pillow. His company was banned from the retail stores because he stood against the cancel culture mob. What happened uh, to My Pillow is not right. And our freedom of speech is just as important as our freedom of self-defense. So we are thrilled to support an American company like MyPillow. Go to MyPillow.com and use the promo code FREEMARKET3. And you'll get up to 66% off America's best pillow. Get a great night's sleep and enjoy the satisfaction of supporting companies fighting against cancel culture. That's MyPillow.com. And use promo code free market three. All right, Mr. Blogman, how are you today? I'm uh, doing well. How are you guys? Yeah. Living <laughs> Been here all day. <laughs> Pretty much. Or at least one of us anyway. Yeah. So um so yeah, this week uh, talking about concealed carry and training. because uh, I noticed when I was on the spreadsheet a couple of days ago that this is concealed carry month on the radio show. Yes, it is. So I thought, well, should probably do something on uh, concealed carry. So here we go. So um, training, uh, a lot of jurisdictions require training in order to get a concealed carry permit. Some places don't. Um, here in California, we do. It's uh, an eight-hour training thing. And, um, you know, it's interesting there, because there's good arguments, I think, on both sides of that. There's people that argue against having some kind of mandatory training. Uh, and there's good arguments for that. And there's some people that argue uh, the benefits or the, you know, the pro side of having a mandatory training requirement. And um, I'm kind of torn with the both of those, I think. Um, and now, you know, being an instructor with this and seeing it every, every week or two, it's like uh, I'm getting more of a perspective on, on this. Because, um, you know, the, the eight-hour training requirement in uh, California – as I think on the on the plus side, it's it's good because one of the things that they cover are um, the legal ramifications, uh, where you can carry, where you can't carry, when you can use deadly force, when you can't use deadly force. Because a lot of that stuff you would think is common sense, but it's not really. Um, you would be surprised at some of the different things that you hear. I, I'm sure a lot of people in class are surprised about when they can or when they can't do this or that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you got to remember, too, a lot of people um, – you know, get a lot of their knowledge on this kind of stuff from TV, from movies and stuff, and most of it's wrong. So I think um, from that perspective, I think requiring or mandating training is good. Um, the other thing, too, there's, uh, at least here in California anyway, there's a, a simple shooting uh, qualification you have to do. And, you know, for most people, if you shoot regularly, by, by regularly I mean at least once a month at the range, I mean the shooting requirement should be pretty simple for most people. But now, you know, teaching these classes, and, and we, um, in our typical class, there'll be 17 or 18 people. Of the 17 or 18, probably five or six or seven or so will be, um, will be renewals, where they're just coming in to renew their certificate. And then the, the rest of them, the other 10 or whatever, um, would be initial uh, permit holders or permit seekers, I guess. And um, it's interesting because you see a variety of um, – of shooting skills there. And like I'm saying, for most people, if you shoot once a month, uh, the qualification's pretty easy. You should be able to do it. But there are some people that struggle with it. So um, I think the shooting qualification is, is probably useful um, to have people demonstrate safe gun handling because surprisingly you see some people, and there's usually one or two in each class, uh, that are a little bit scary with that kind of stuff because it's, it's obvious they don't do it a lot. Uh, things like keeping your finger off of the trigger, for instance, that's not a natural kind of movement because um, your hand wants to grab things. The way the gun is made, obviously, is your finger wants to go to that trigger. And it's keeping your finger straight and off the trigger is, is learned behavior. 
So there's stuff like that, you know, muzzling people and things like that. So, um, you know, the, the mandatory training is good from that perspective. The downside or the argument against mandatory training is, um, you know, one thing is it costs money. It's going to be a couple hundred bucks probably to do an eight-hour course at most places. And that's, you know, for a lot of people, that's not a big deal. But for then there are a lot of people where that is a big deal. Um, you know, people where, you know, $200 or so is a, a chunk of money. And uh, you put that on top of what it costs them for ammunition, what it's going to cost them to get the gun and the belt and the holster and all the other stuff that goes with it. Uh, you could price certain people out of their basic right to being able to defend themselves. So, you know, there's arguments for and against that. The other thing, too, is realistically, in an eight-hour training, it's, it's really not enough. I mean, it's, it's better than nothing. But um, realistically, you have to commit to, um, to learning things, and you have to commit to learning a lot of stuff. And one of the things I tell students is, you know, the gun part is the easy part. Uh, that's probably the quickest, easiest thing uh, to learn. The other stuff that you need to know is, um, you know, essentially, and it's almost as important, I guess, as being good with the gun or proficient with the gun, is um, how to avoid ever having to use the gun in the first place. Yeah. So learning about how predators behave, how predators act, how to avoid becoming a victim, um, that sort of stuff. The uh, being aware, you know, I don't want to say situational awareness, but being aware when you're out in public, how not to look like a victim. Um, learning that kind of stuff is, is a lot more, and you're not going to get that in an eight-hour class. I mean, we, we kind of cover that stuff, but you really need to seek that stuff out. Um, there's other things even, you know, aside from just going to the, um, going to the range, uh, something else that you'll get, cause I always encourage people, okay, it's nice to go to the range. You should go at least once a month that, you know, that's probably a minimum. Um, but, uh, you should also take classes from qualified instructors, you know, at least a handful of times each year, and then take the stuff you learn in the class and practice that at the range. Because it's doing you no good if you've got bad habits and things and you're just reinforcing them at the range by yourself, repeating your bad habits. And one of the things you'll get in a class is how to deal with malfunctions. And, and that's an important skill to have. If your gun does not uh, work the way it's supposed to work, you know, how do you clear that? And there was a, um, there was a great video on, uh, on uh, active self-protection. John Korea had it on a couple of days ago. And um, it was a... Uh, it was a police officer responding to, uh, they had a domestic violence thing, and there was a guy that was stalking his girlfriend. And he was outside of the apartment, and he was waving a gun around and threatening people. So the police pull up, and the guy's on the stairway going up to the second floor of the apartments. And they contact him, and he's not going to cooperate, and they're trying to talk him down. And he starts moving up the stairs, so the police follow him up the stairs. They get to the second floor landing, and the guy pulls out a gun, so the police officer shoots at him, fires several shots, and then his gun malfunctions. And you see this police officer, he starts yelling, uh, double feed, double feed, double feed, and he turns around, and he starts running, because you can see the body camera, so you're <laughs> seeing all this. And he's running down the stairs saying, double feed, double feed, double feed, he runs down the stairs around the corner still saying, double feed, double feed, and then he starts trying to pick at it. And, you know, a couple of things are all, I mean, I could see the initial reaction uh, letting his partner know that, hey, I've got something wrong, you need to step up and be primary. So I, I thought that part was okay. And I'll give him, um, you know, a little bit of a pass because he's just involved in a gunfight. So, okay, he's going to be all, all jacked up on right. adrenaline and stuff. But, okay, once you start getting down the, uh, down the stairs, it was obvious that he didn't know how to clear it. And I think that might be a training issue um, because, uh, you know, different agencies are different. But a lot of them just have uh, – you know, a couple of times a year, basically, the officers have to go and they have to requalify. And I'm guessing that clearing malfunctions is not part of their qualification. It's probably just a shooting thing. Well, and, like, even when we take classes, like if you go to Front Sight, if you do the charity shoot, um, part of the testing at the end of the yeah. class is being able to clear that exact kind of malfunction. And they give you, well, they give you three or four seconds or something to do yeah, it. Yep. Um, you know, but it's a training like thing. So that kind of stuff, I mean, if you're a, a private citizen, you know, as a concealed carry, you should know how to do that stuff. And um, if the cop doesn't know how to do it, you darn sure better. Well, and it. again, and it illustrates, you know, first, you know, if you're involved in something like that, you're going to be all adrenalated just like he was. And, you know, you need to have training where that kind of stuff is natural. Wow. Emily Chen, a.k.a. Aim to Misbehave on Instagram, is with us. Stick around to hear us chat about CCWs for women 
with this instructor and, com- and competition shooter. All right, first, but folks, I did that backwards. PrimeRes.com slash Alpine if you're all into mortgage. And are you in the military? Are you looking for help with a VA loan? Or if you're looking to buy, refi, or maybe considering a reverse mortgage, call our local mortgage guy that you can trust. That would be Chris Wiley at PRMI Mortgage. For nearly 25 years, Chris has been helping local San Diegans with all their mortgage needs. Call Chris Wiley at 619-722-1303 or just go to primeres.com slash alpine. All right, Emily, how are you? Having me. You bet. Well, thanks for coming on. I heard you were uh, you were at the range all day today instructing. I literally just walked in like five minutes ago. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. So it's uh, CCW month on uh, Gun Owners Radio, and you are an instructor. You've been an instructor for, for a few years now. How did you get into firearms in the first place? Oh, wow. It's quite a bit of a long story. So um, I started shooting recreationally when I was 13 years old. My father was the one who introduced it to me. I didn't really have any formal training from him. It was really just an introductory thing like, hey, this is a car. This is how you drive it. Here's a gun. Here's how you shoot it. Right. It's the typical I'm going to load it for you. I'm going to just hold your hands while you're aiming forward and then you can press the trigger. Um, And it wasn't until I was a little bit older, so I turned 18, and at the time, California allowed you to buy long guns then. And so I purchased a long gun, um, a shotgun specifically to do trap and skeet shooting, sporting clays in general. And that's something that I was competitive in to start off with. Um, And I had the pleasure of working with Josh Lakatos and Kim Rohde um, over at Prado Olympic Shooting Park. Did that for a couple years, and then when I was able to purchase my first handgun at 21, that's where I throwing myself into getting serious training. Um, At the time, it was still recreational, but I realized I got really good at it, and I really wanted to just uh, become more disciplined with it. And um, once I realized that it wasn't just defensive shooting, there was competitive shooting, I threw myself into that as well. So just over the years, I literally went into debt just trying to be a better shooter overall. Um, and when I decided I wanted to be an instructor, it was about five years ago. Um, and so how I got about doing that was, um, I discovered Artifacts Firearms Training, who I still work with today. They're over at Prado Olympic Shooting Park. And, um, in the middle of a shooting and, you know, just talking about where I want to go in my career, I mentioned I'd like to be an instructor and I was wondering if you can give me some tips on how to do that. And they said, well, we'd love to have you on board. You know, we don't have a female instructor. I think that you're very personable and you can definitely help us out. What do you think? And I said, absolutely, I'd love to. And most of my experience came from uh, learning how to be an instructor through artifacts. And so uh, I've been loyal with them ever since. Um, And as of right now, I've actually discovered that I wanted to teach on my own. So I started my own company and I'm teaching locally in Oceanside at Ironside. So that's kind of basically the basics of how i've progressed thus far there does seem to be a, there's a big uh i don't know division but there's definitely a couple of couple of different groups of uh of gun owners um and you know some are you know some are for sport and some are for defense you know some people look at it as a as a hobby or something they do for fun uh some people it's it's a very practical and and purposeful decision that they make um, to own a gun because they're looking to defend themselves. And there's a lot of overlap. You know, there's a lot of people that, that are, you know, into the sport of it but still carry it for, for defense. You know, what, what do you think the diff- – what's the difference in the mindset? Or when you, when you see somebody uh, in one of your classes and, and, and you know, hey, this person's here to defend their life, you see somebody else and, hey, this is somebody that wants to get really good, you know, out at the, in an IDPA match or something like that. What, what, do you, what, what do you notice about the difference in that person or their mindset? I would say that it's literally just one thing. It's how they approach, um, you know, whether it's the subject itself, whether it's defensive shooting or competitiveness, it's I'm doing this because of this reason. Um, You know, like you were just mentioning, there's a huge difference between defensive and recreational. And um, down to the bottom of it, skill-wise, there is no difference. You can definitely switch back and forth using the same techniques and it's always going to be the same. But I think in general, students, you know, they 
use that purpose, that drive, the I want to protect my family as a reason to continue doing it. Um, whereas, you know, maybe some people who are proficient in firearms and they're competitive, they don't really see it from a defensive standpoint, but still announce to themselves that they can still use these skills in a defensive situation if necessary. So when they go compete, they might be a lot more relaxed, you know, um, they're a lot more social about it and they're more focused on point scores, not so much on a defensive, like, oh, I should hit in these vital areas to get the best, um, you know, the best results as far as protecting myself and my family. Uh, at the end of the day, it's just how you approach it. And I've seen it from, from multiple students that, you know, they don't really have one way of thinking it, especially when I explain to them why. They kind of open up to the idea of competitive shooting, especially when time is involved, which is an extremely um, per, a huge factor in competitive shooting and defensive shooting as well. So, you know, Emily, we were just talking uh, on the last segment about, about training and concealed carry. And one of the things, because um, when I teach, uh, you know, I always suggest, especially to uh, new concealed carriers, that they take a look at competitive shooting. And one of the things we were talking about on the last segment was being able to clear a uh, malfunction. And uh, I was referencing a, a video with a police officer that was having a lot of trouble with that. But when you shoot competitively, that's one of the things that you pick up. You pick up a bunch of really good stuff that can help you defensively. But when you're shooting in a match and your gun malfunctions, being able to clear that very quickly becomes almost second nature. And that's a great skill that carries over into the defensive world as well. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, one of the things that we, we were talking about clearing malfunctions, and obviously the, the purpose of clearing a malfunction and learning how to do it properly is clearing a malfunction <laughs> but and um, doing it properly and doing it properly but honestly i found that it just all around makes you feel more comfortable with your firearm you know whatever however you're manipulating your firearm whether you're bringing it out of your holster putting it in your holster you know getting uh you know your muzzle on top, just handling your firearm you know the ability to clear malfunctions makes it has made me anyway a lot more comfortable with my firearm uh all around um but uh you know so okay so you've been an instructor for for five years um, tell us a little bit about the road to, to becoming an instructor. How do you know, how, how, what, what does that path look like? If someone out there thinks, you know, geez, I, I, I can teach people how to shoot a gun. You know, that sounds like a fun job. How did, how did your path go with becoming an instructor? Um, so definitely go out there and take as many courses as possible, whether it's to get certificates, which I need to mention, they're pieces of paper. They don't really mean anything, but you know, in the industry, it's good to have documentation of your progress. Um, and, you know, the NRA offers uh, courses specifically for those who are interested in, in instructing, and so does USCCA. Um, and you also have other professionals out there who train others to be, a, be instructors as well, whether it's to learn how to speak to your students, how to connect with them and explain to them either the anatomy of the gun or why is it that we're shooting it a specific way. Um, to, you know, talking about tactics and all these things. It's, it's all vital, everything about it. It's a psychological and emotional concept that people, I don't think, really really think about. Um, and at the end of the day, what I actually tell students is that um, shooting is a mind game. So how can you begin to explain that to your students? Um, the best way to be able to figure that out is to go out and train. Like, I went into debt taking as many courses um, as much as possible. Um, the other thing to becoming an instructor is knowing how to be an instructor. Um, it's great if you know how to shoot well. There's plenty of people out there who are far better shooters than I am, but are they capable of being able to relay the message to whoever they decide they're teaching? Are they personable? Are they patient? Um, can they explain why they're doing things a specific way? And can they also be comfortable with sharing knowledge from other instructors. Um, sometimes I've seen instructors who are very hell-bent on keeping their students from knowing that there are others out there, um, but luckily most of them are not like that. And I am a huge uh, advocate for sharing my students with other instructors because my biggest goal in life is to make sure that my students are set up for success. Um, and so I think if you want to be an instructor, you really have to understand that it's not about you it's really about your students like how can you take them to that next level and to help them reach their goals nice so competition you got really into competition it sounded like it was uh you know something that really uh 
uh, really appealed to you. Um, what do you get out of competition? What, what, what does it do for you personally to compete? Um, when I compete, and I'm not the best competitor in the world, it teaches me a lot. It teaches me about my flaws, about my strengths. Um, I have a general idea of uh, how well I'm doing. And it's important because when I switch over to that defensive mindset, all those skills, all the times that I've noted in the middle of a competition can and will be applied to a defensive situation. Um, and so I kind of use those two as parallels with each other. Um, and so for me, my biggest thing when it comes to a competition is pushing myself to see how well I can do. And, you know, it could be a complete flop and that's totally fine, but that also teaches you what it's going to be like when you're under duress because a lot of people don't see competitions as you being under duress because word duress is more of a, you know, defensive mindset. However, when you think about being quick and being accurate, there's a lot of pressure that's going on in your mind. And a lot of times we tend to think and overthink things, and that can also be a flaw. So a lot of times for me, it's how can I manage myself while I'm, I am out there running and gunning. And what do you, so for pistol competitions, what do you do? You do IDPA or just, just any kind of defensive pistol uh, competition that you can Actually, find? Actually, I shoot USPSA. USPSA. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, so I used to do this uh, kind of this informal competition at, at Lemon Grove Rod and Gun here in San Diego. And I did it for a couple of years just because it was really fun. And I've told this story on the air before, but we had a, a, a glass break in our house. We thought somebody was, was uh, uh, breaking into our house at like three in the morning. It was, it was, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say it was terrifying to me and my wife both. Um, and I remember uh, very vividly s standing there in my room, got up, you know, jumped out of bed, grabbed my gun, and I remember there ho holding my Glock and thinking to myself, in a split second, I'm really glad I did all those competitions because I oh, feel really absolutely. comfortable right now. Mm. And uh, absolutely, good. I'm so sorry to hear that there was an incident. You know, like well, it turned out to be absolutely. nothing. <laughs> okay, there, it, it wasn't. Good. Yeah, you know, it was not. It, it wasn't somebody that actually broke in. It was just scary. It was a cat. Oh. <laughs> Of course, yeah. it's a cat. It's always so the cat. The, the fact is that you are mentally prepared for that moment because you trained for it. Exactly right. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to hold you over. We're going to go to a quick commercial break, break Emily, and then we're going to uh, we're going to continue talking to you. Sounds good. All righty now. So we are proud to partner with the National Concealed Carry Association as a ten ring partner. NCCA exists to serve the Second Amendment community by providing a nationwide network of two A advocates. They offer elite self-defense and concealed carry training from the nation's top instructors. And they provide rock-bottom prices on the best selection of gear and accessories. Learn more about them at nationalconcealedcarryassociation.com. So we're talking to instructor and competition shooter Emily Chen. You can find her on Instagram under the name aim 2 misbehave That's aim number 2 misbehave So tell us about the Instagram. You have like 7500 followers or something like that. How did all that uh, how did all that happen? I don't know. Honestly, I really don't. Um, I get that question asked a lot and I'm actually surprised that people find my uh, page interesting because, you know, a lot of times with social media and females, females are depicted a certain way and that's how they gain their followers. And, you know, I have very few far between photos that are similar to that. Um, but most of my content is in regards to my progression in shooting, whether it's for myself or, you know, being able to advertise my competitive shooting and my students as well. I don't ever really post too much about my students simply because I like to keep them safe. I don't really like the idea of, you know, a random stranger knowing whether or not they have a gun unless my student gives me uh, consent to be able to post something. I tend to keep it private because, as you and I both know, it's the element of surprise in a defensive situation is just a lot more to your advantage. Yeah, so the so you just put up an Instagram page and, and didn't really try, just kind of started putting up some some uh, some pictures and videos, and next thing you know, you have you have over 7,000 people looking at your Instagram? Yeah, and that's wow. just kind of <laughs> gradually increased over the years. I would say probably in the last, like, uh, probably, yeah, four or five years, actually. Um, I just did it because I thought it would be fun to kind of show people that this is what I'm passionate about. But it's and not like a – it's, it. it's not like a – it's not like a, it's, it's, 
how do I? It's 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 not like a business thing. It's just it's your just your private Instagram. It, it you know I do have it open for the public, so anybody can follow me if they wish. Um, I used to just start it off as, hey, this is what I'm doing. I think it's fun, and I'm pretty sure other people relate. But now I actually use it as a platform to market my abilities as an instructor and a competitive shooter as well. Oh, cool. Have you ever been uh, Have you ever been recognized? Has anyone ever come up and said, hey, I follow your Instagram? I've definitely had that happen a few times. And, you know, I'm very honored anytime someone recognizes me. Um, but that goes also towards the negative side. I've had a couple stalkers that have shown up to the ranges um, just randomly, which is kind of interesting because, you know, I have a loaded gun on me at all times for that specific reason. And I don't know why they decided to show up at the range of all places. Um, however, yeah, it's, it's pretty much open for anybody that wants to follow and be interested in how to go about learning how to shoot. That's really what it's become. So this is such a cliche question, and I was trying to think of another way to ask it, but it's kind of an important question. In a lot of ways, it's it's uh, uh, it's extremely helpful. But um, being a woman, uh, being an instructor, and in the firearms industry, you know, how has that been? Is it tougher? Is it easier? Is there are there parts of it that's good and bad? I I wouldn't say that I've ever really had any negative experiences as an instructor. I've not really experienced too much sexism. That has been very minimal. And um, I've been very blessed with, you know, other coworkers, other instructors that I work with who who are male, and they always stand up for me. You know, they have no issues shutting someone down if that's what they want to do. But honestly, most of my experiences is that the male students are sometimes doubtful um, just from appearances. But as soon as we get into the lesson and they give me a chance to prove to them why I'm worthy of being their instructor, they pretty much wipe it out of their memory and we just go forward from there. And with my, my female students, you know, um, I've never had the experience where I've been apprehensive or anxious about approaching a male dominant uh, industry and doing it recreationally or defensively. Um, I've grown up or mostly around men. So I've never really had the idea of, Oh my gosh, this is just what men do. And I'm scared. But from what I'm being told, it's that women like learning from other women because they just kind of click. And I, I, find, I don't really know how that works, but it does. You know, we have this, these shooting socials that we do. Um, and we've, you know, had thousands of people go through and I don't typically mentor one on one. I typically I have to manage and organize and, and run them. So I, I I get the opportunity to see, you know, ten to twenty people uh, teaching, um, and we do these three times a month. And I've seen hundreds of people go through. I'm I'm by no means an, an expert. I'm just there to, you know, herd cats. Um, but in in I think it's the first time I've ever said this on the air. But the women mentors are actually way better teachers than the men. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. They're way better teachers. They take it really seriously. They have a little bit more of a uh, – I've noticed that women, when they teach, have a little bit more of a method where men are a little bit more of a – here, just, you know, here, pull the trigger. You yeah, know, like and, your dad. And I'll uh, – yeah. yeah, I'll uh, I'll correct you as you go. <laughs> not, that's not okay. every single person, but uh, it, by right. and large, our women mentors are, are really, really great. Well, that's awesome to hear. Um, and now that I'm thinking about it, it might just be because, uh, you know, women, from what I've observed, they tend to have a more nurturing side. Mm -hmm. And so men are, uh, you know, more mechanical, which I'm I actually gravitate towards more the mechanical side. Um, so I'm still learning how to connect with other women. Um, but I've learned that the more patient that you are and the more that you're able to explain the methods. Um, to shooting successfully, then there's a lot more uh, acceptance. So that's, as far as I know, that's just been successful for me. So what's the biggest thing that you teach? So when you get a brand new student in, man or woman, whatever, um, what's the biggest thing you, you, you teach? What's, what's the most common or most important thing or most unique thing that, that you teach people about uh, firearms? Um, it's basic fundamentals. You know, I have a lot of students that are also uh, intermediate and advanced. I have students that come in saying that they are, but then when I meet them for the first time and I watch their, you know, the way that they shoot, what their fun fundamentals are, that's where we start fixing deficiencies. So I would say um, I always start off with basic pistol stuff. I can teach rifle. I can uh, teach shotgun. 
Um, long guns are not necessarily what people approach me with. However, I have students that also want to learn three guns, so I'm able to teach them that as well. But for the most part, it's, it's pistols, and they realize very quickly that it all comes down to basics. And when you when you uh, what's the breakdown? Do you do you teach a lot of women, or, or is it fifty fifty men women, or what's the what what would you estimate your breakdown is as far as students? It's, I would say it's about fifty fifty. Wow, really? Fifty fifty men yeah. and women. Yeah, um, especially here in Oceanside because you know there's Camp Pendleton and a lot of young Marines or Marines in general who have pistol calls. They uh, call me and they show up, and so we run run them through everything. And so I, I just get 50-50 on both sides. I don't think – 10 years ago, I don't think there were a lot of instructors getting 50-50. But it really has seemed – I think the last decade – and I kept hearing, you know, uh, that women are the fastest-growing demographic and the – you know, blah, 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 blah. And I kept hearing it, and you kept reading it, but I'm definitely now seeing it. There are – we've had these shooting socials, again, we've had uh, a number of shooting socials where every person that signed up – and they're open to the public – Every person that signed up just happened to be a woman. It wasn't like a women's group that, that joined right. us or whatever. So it's it's really, really amazing. What's the most rewarding thing about teaching a woman? Oh, well, I guess I don't quite understand the question because to me, gender isn't a factor. Because when you're shooting, it's all about skills. It's, it's a mechanical tool. And it's just like driving a car, you know, they don't really recognize it as a gender thing. It's just, how do I do it properly? Um, so I, I can't really answer your question because I don't really know how. Well, what's the most rewarding thing about teaching anybody? Um, just being able to reach their goal, whatever that is, whether it's from a defensive mindset or just trying to progress their skill overall. Um, and so, you know, I ask those questions ahead of time so that I get a better idea about how to get them to where they want to be. Um, and so if they say, yeah, you know, I'm a brand new gun owner, I've never shot a gun in my life or even held one, but I want to protect my family, which has happens to have been the case recently because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, you know, I say, I think the best option for you is to start off with the basics. And then when you're more comfortable, if you feel like you're ready, we can start talking about getting you a CCW permit w within your county. And you like that idea because you're giving them options and you're letting them know that, hey, um, you know, you have the potential to do all these amazing things it's just up to you whether or not you want it what's the most common thing that gun owners are doing wrong <sighs> safety safety you know, really like muzzling people or what what or what 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 in what specifically specifically i would say that they forget to take their finger off the trigger um mm -hmm. you know the second thing would be keeping it pointed in a not safe direction because what happens is that when you're teaching a student who's absorbing all this new material, they are overwhelmed. And so what I try to do is break everything down um, and simplify things as much as possible so that once they accomplish those specific tasks, then I can push them to doing, um, you know, the next skill sets or the next couple tasks. And then at the very end, should we have time, we would just combine everything together. Um, so I find that simplifying things is the best way to teach a student. Hey, Emily, this is Dave. I'm going to help Mike out with that question he asked you earlier about, you know, how good does it make you feel? Do you start to see after you've taught somebody, they call you back up for future training? And I guess yes. that, now that would I be do. that would be the gratification, wouldn't you think? I suppose. So. Yes, absolutely. You know, it, it's a reaffirmation of you're a good instructor mm -hmm. and that they vibe with you well and that they want to continue learning because they, they see that they have potential. And I guess for me, I, I don't really uh, think about my rewards too much because I'm more thinking about rewarding my students, you know, giving them that positive feedback. But um, I guess uh, to answer your question, I'm, and I'm sorry that I missed this, it's that that light bulb moment. Mm -hmm, when you're mm -hmm. explaining something and the student couldn't understand it the first time, but they trust you and they go through the repetitions. And then when it finally clicks and they right. understand what they're doing and why, uh, and then they succeed at it henceforth, like that to me is great. Well, um, I, I actually, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I actually received a text message uh, as I was calling in today. And I have a student, his name's Mike, and he went to a group class today. And it turns out that he won some kind of reward uh, at the end of the day student. And he was doing, like, I think it was two gun or something. So to hear that he was the best shooter out of everybody, ah. that that's rewarding for me. That's because awesome. um, 
as long as he's happy, I'm happy. There you go. Well, keep keep up the good work because when people ask for you again, that's to me the ultimate in teaching. Because uh, you know you don't go to 15 different dentists or 15 different hair stylists, but when you are going to handle a firearm and you've got somebody that you like to train with, and they keep asking for you, that's a major compliment. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Well, we live in a state where your self-defense rights are under attack. Let us be your voice to help defend and restore the Second Amendment. Help spread the word about the fight. There's two easy things that you can do. One, like and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, Instagram, the podcast, or whatever way you like to listen to the show. Number two, share the show with one friend. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, together we will win. All right, folks. So every week, we this is everybody's favorite segment, Stump My Nephew. Mm-hmm. Um, every week we get somebody to write in a question, uh, and if we use it on the air, we give you a hat or a shirt from San Diego County Gun Owners. If you stump my nephew, my 21-year-old nephew, um, you'll get a front sight membership, which is a lifetime of firearms training, which is very, very, very cool. I'm going to do something a little different today, too. We're going to uh, – Sam, you there? Yeah, how are you guys? Good, man. How are you? Not bad. I mean, uh, I did get stumped the past two weeks in a row, so that hurts, but <laughs> I, I'm back. You're back. Well, I don't know. It would be interesting to see if you get this one. But uh, above and beyond the usual question, we're actually going to do a little uh, – I have three terms I want you to define uh, and see if you see if you get these terms right. We'll have a little talk about it after your, after your, your question because I did my mic drop early, so you, we were giving the whole segment to you and your – your uh, breadth of knowledge. Breadth of knowledge? Is that right? That'll work. Breadth of knowledge, yeah. yeah. All right. A cornucopia. Very well. Cornucopia. Not a que- don't ask him that question. Don't- <laughs> All right. So here we go. Um, Brad from La Jolla. Joe, you want to ask this question? No. No. Go ahead. You ask. All right. Yeah, Brad. <laughs> yeah. You ask that question. We're both worried about the that one word we can't pronounce. Our- <laughs> Brad from La Jolla wants to know, how do you fire an Armatix Smart System IP1 pistol. How do you fire an Armatix Smart System IP1 pistol? That's A R M A T I X. Armatix Smart System IP1 pistol. Okay, um, so this is this is referring to a smart gun system, which very briefly is a firearm that's designed with some sort of built-in electronic component um, to verify the user uh, before it can be used, like um, like how you have a password for your computer, hopefully. Um, now, as I rec- I'm not too terribly familiar, familiar with smart gun systems because not a lot of them have, have made it to production. But as I recall, the Armatix uses uh, an RFID chip in a wristband. And when you have the wristband, it might be a ring, but I think it's a wristband. And when you have the wristband close to it, then it uh, it unlocks the pistol and can be fired. Am I am I correct there? You're exactly right. The pistol won't fire unless a radio signal uh, watch or wristband. Uh, I think they actually have both. I remember a ring and a and a uh, anyway some kind of uh, piece of jewelry um, located within 40 centimeters of the, of the of the pistol. It has to be within 40 centimeters of the pistol, and the watch won't activate unless a fingerprint and pin code are entered into it. So basically, you got to put on this watch or this wristband. I don't even know if it was a – is it a real watch or is it just kind of hang out on your wrist? Does it actually tell time? Um, I don't know. I don't know either. So you have this this <laughs> wristband and you have to – you have to – you have to – Activate it. have to activate. have it. You have to wear it and then you have to activate it with your fingerprint and then put a pin code in and then as long as your wrist isn't 40 centimeters away from your pistol – it will you'll, your pistol will fire. And good news, it does tell time. Is uh, roughly sixteen inches, I believe. If if I if I did that uh, mental math correctly. Now, um, smart guns. Part of the reason they they haven't seen widespread uh, production and use is because electronic systems are notoriously insecure and um, traditionally very technologically conservative gun people are kind of afraid of having 
basically guns that can be hacked or, or guns that might not always work when you want them to because, you know, electronics aren't 100 percent reliable. And given how close you are there to um, an office for what is it, Broadcom or Qualcomm, one of those uh, one of those chip makers, probably anyone who who works in sort of um, uh, integrated circuit design or, or any sort of electronic related field listening right now is probably going, what, you want to put computers in guns? No. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> so was this its own pistol? Do you remember this? Or was this like a, this get like adapted to a pistol or was it its own standalone pistol? It was its own standalone device. Um, so now I'm you have to worry, aware now you have to worry about if firearms it, that have actually been retrofitted outside of probably <laughs> someone experimenting in their basement or garage or whatever. Um, I don't think any firearms have really been retrofitted into smart guns, um, except Remington 700s that used special um, laser ignited primers, but I don't really count those. Um, it's, it, it's kind of difficult to shove more technology into a, a package that small than it is to just redesign the thing from the ground up. So Dave, not only do you have to worry about wearing this watch all the time, you know, if somebody breaks mm -hmm. in, you have to worry about the actual, you know, the fingerprint system working. Or, or, or better than that, what's my code? What's you, my then you got to remember the code in well, the middle of the night. There's probably a million reasons why this is a terrible idea, but one of the real obvious ones is, you know, we train shooting primary hand, shooting support hand. So if something happens to your primary hand, you switch the gun over. If, you're, if your wristband is on that primary hand and that hand's more than, what, 40 centimeters away from the gun, it's not firing. Or what if you're in the shower? You can't be in the shower with your wristband, and that's a way. I didn't shower with my gun, either. <laughs> yeah, you do. I, you don't have a shower gun? Come shower holster. On. Who doesn't have a shower, shower gun? gun? Well, but the thing is, you, you, now you, this is the gun you have to pick. I mean, you can't. I can't use my Glock. You know that. I mean, think of how uh, possessive you Sounds are like of a your gun. Guns. The government would make. Yeah. Does well, this gun come with a micro stamp? Yeah. Exactly. Does it come with a micro stamp? Won't be on our roster. Is it? Is it? Uh, is it reliable? Is it something I'd even want to use? The whole thing stinks. Stinks. People uh -huh. are already cagey about new uh, new firearms released by companies with little experience in firearm manufacturing, let alone when they use some some kind of new and unproven mm -hmm. technique. Mm -hmm. Can I find magazines? Can I find parts? Can I find someone to service it? If it fails, is it something that I take to an armorer or a gunsmith? Or is it um, is it an IC that got desoldered from from its uh, ball grid array, and I need to take it to uh, like an electronics repair store, or a so computer repairman, or like Apple Apple Watch? Yeah. Apple, you can take it to the Apple Store. Apple you turn store. it off and turn it back on. It is called an IP1 pistol, which sounds very Apple-y, but yeah, I don't think it was. I don't think it was an Apple product. Okay, you got that excellent job. Now we're going to go for the. Uh, for the, the uh, bonus, uh, course, the, the bonus, bonus round. round. Yeah. So the, congratulations, the, you broke your two week streak of of being stumped. So Brad from La Jolla, you get a, a hat or a t shirt, but you do not get a uh, front site membership. Okay, so I have I have three terms here that I want you to define and talk about. They're actually uh, fairly common um, in the gun world, but I'll bet you a lot of people don't really know all about them or what they mean, that sort of thing. So I thought we'd have you define them. The first one is FUD. What, what is FUD? Um, now you're getting into slang, which is a lot of fun. Um, especially for someone who works in a gun store, a uh, FUD, first of all, comes from Elmer FUD, the, uh, the Looney Tunes character. Right. Um, famous for, for being a, a hunter walking around, um, clumsily handling his shotgun. A FUD is, is someone usually, but not always an older person who is kind of disdainful of, um, newer type firearms and uh, kind of takes the attitude of, oh, well, I'm fine with my bolt action rifle. They're never going to come for that. <laughs> well, um, yes, they are. Um, people, people who sort of look down their noses at other types of firearms and other types of firearm owners um, are, are just sort of harming the whole community. You have to be a little more inclusive than that in, instead of gatekeeping out basically anything invented after 1950. Well, so it does. It's a you know derogatory or kind of a you know poking fun at kind of the old school gun guys who don't really know what's going on. 
in the modern Second Amendment world. But it also stands for something. Did you know that? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of it having been uh, backronymed into anything. It what is it? Backronymed. It's exactly what they did. It also stands for fear, uncertainty, doubt, and disinformation. Fear, uncertainty, doubt, and disinformation. So whenever okay, you talk, so we're talking disinformation, like oh, a twenty-two is the most the the most lethal round because it bounces around inside your body. Right, there exactly. You go. That's something. Like that's that fud. One. That's something a fud would say, and that would be described as fud. So whenever you you hear somebody you know talk about how like look if you know just get a revolver, they never jam. You know, uh, yeah, all right, fud. That's Thanks. a fud. Yeah, and you hear someone describe it as a fud. Okay, LARP. What's a LARP? Um, stands for live action role play comes from people who would go to like Renaissance fairs and, and dress up in period costumes and fight each other or whatever, um, used in the gun community to refer to people who blow lots and lots of money on gear because they want to look cool yeah. and it, they think it makes them cool. Yeah. Hey, I used to be a LARP. <laughs> I went to Renaissance fairs for years. <laughs> Dressed as a king. I well, this is like somebody that's got like all this, you know, military get up and, and they just go down to the range and, you know, when it's, you know, they call them LARPs. It's kind, of, it's kind of a, you know, not not so harsh, but derogatory term. Okay, here's the last one. This one's pretty interesting. The term loophole, you know, we use the term loophole, or at least the anti-gunners use the term loophole a lot to describe uh, gun laws, that sort of thing. But where did that actually originate from? What's the What's the origin of loophole? Um, loophole comes from uh, medieval fortification building. If you look at the uh, the crenellations on castles, you'll see these uh, rectangular slits um, or cross shaped slits called arrow loops, yep. um, which are used to to fire down on um, attacking forces right. by archers. And it, it was it was basically considered a huge advantage and kind of not fair that these archers got to shoot through this. But that's why there's a loophole, like the gun show loophole. Excellent job, Sam. Fantastic as always. Thanks for having me on. Lots of uh, fun stuff to talk about tonight. Yeah, it was a good one. Not No doubt about it. All right, folks. Hey, if you're listening on YouTube or a podcast, hit the like and subscribe button. Share the show with your friends. Please support all our sponsors, San Diego County Gun Owners, U.S. Law Shield, Dillon Law Group, the RMI Mortgage, Black Island Optics, and National Steel Carry. Thanks to Joe, Mike, Sam, the gunman, and our digital doctor, Brendan Thomas, on Gun Owners Radio, FM 961, AM 1170, The Answer. This program is sponsored by Dave Stahl.